It's not often a company builds something and tells you not to buy it, but that's exactly what happened with this little Cyberdeck. But why not? It has a CPU that some people say is going to bring down Intel's x86 monopoly. If you shouldn't buy it, why does it exist? And can it run Doom? We'll get to Doom, but as to why it exists, it's the first RISC-V Cyberdeck, meant for developers who want to start trying out the latest fancy chip architecture in style. But why shouldn't you buy this thing? Well, I've been using it, and it's just not that good. Even if it does fit nicely in my cargo pants. And just based on performance, it's a terrible deal compared to this tiny Intel N100 netbook. The N100 costs less while being 10 times faster. And that's before we talk about software support. SciPeed sent me this tiny Leashy Console 4A a couple months ago. It's not meant to compete with Intel though, at least not yet. This thing's more like an older Raspberry Pi. It's even slower than the ARM CPUs in other tiny cyberdecks like the MNT Pocket Reform, which admittedly isn't available yet. So I guess this thing has that going for it. The unique thing about this guy isn't the size or even the cute little mouse nubbin, it's the processor inside. But before we open it up, let's take a look around the outside. It's tiny, so there's not a whole lot going on, but they did manage a gigabit ethernet jack on the back, which is more than most pro laptops have these days. The port's not the easiest to use, but I'm happy it's there. On the right side, there's a headphone jack, a little hole I presume is for a microphone, a USB 3.0 port, and a microSD card slot. On the back, besides ethernet, there's a USB-C port, mini HDMI, power, and another USB-A port. And flipping it over, there's a little slot you can pop off to reveal a 2242 M.2 slot for an NVMe SSD. The high-end version of this thing includes a 1TB SSD for an extra 100 bucks. All models include a 12 volt power adapter and a mini HDMI cable. Overall, it's nice and small. A little heavy at 600 grams, but it fits in a lot of places a laptop won't, like my pocket. I don't want to tear this down until after I test it out, so let's start by getting it booted up. And that's funny, it's actually booting sideways. This display probably comes from a tablet with a portrait layout, so all this boot text scrolls across the display instead of down. Luckily, the desktop environment turns back to landscape, but that's one of the fun little quirks you get on a dev kit like this. Also fun, it booted in Chinese the first time. Luckily, some things are still in English, so I clicked on terminal and entered the incantation to get it back into English. It connected to my Wi-Fi 6 network, and Chromium worked fine, just a little sluggish. It feels to me somewhere between like a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4, which is to say, even a cheap Chromebook would be a lot faster if you just want to browse the web. YouTube loads okay, but anything above 480p is a waste, it just makes things kind of choppy. And it does have sound, surprisingly. The tinny speakers are okay, but don't expect much. I played back a few videos, and besides a cracking issue every now and then, the speakers were audible, just not very loud. I also tested their two example videos, and both of them played back okay, but even with their optimized 4K video, there was a little screen tearing. The display itself is a touchscreen. I fired up the included GIMP and tested painting with my finger. It tracks decently out of the box, but for general use, the desktop environment is not touch-friendly at all. It's almost impossible to use the touchscreen for pretty much anything besides drawing. Not to mention, if you use the touchscreen a lot, you're going to smudge that camera. Not that it matters, the camera isn't going to win any awards, but it does work and the focus and exposure are fine, it's just not amazing. There's also this little hole on the right that I presumed was a built-in mic, but I tried Audacity and the Pulse Audio Mixer and nothing detected a mic input. So even if you love the camera, you'll have to get a USB mic to get sound into this thing. But overall, this thing is slow. But if you're willing to live with it, it's not unbearable. And quirks? <laughs> this thing has those in spades. I'm not going to harp on them, because like I said earlier, SciPeed even says this thing isn't like a Chromebook or a MacBook. It's a dev machine. But I'll run through those quirks really quick. This red point tracking nub is nowhere near as good as a track point. The tracking is not amazing, and it requires a lot of force to use it. It's gotten a little better after a couple weeks, but not much. The keyboard layout is, well, it's a keyboard layout. I used a netbook in college, so I'm used to adjusting to a tiny keyboard, but some of the key placements here are baffling. Like the period is almost impossible to touch type since it's tiny and in the middle of two other keys. And the apostrophe is tough to hit too. Generally though, it's passable for being so small, and I can type faster on it than my iPad for what that's worth. The fan runs all the time, and the screen stays on even when you close it. There isn't any kind of lid sensor. There's no brightness controls, only a terminal command to set the brightness level. You can charge it with USB-C while it's booted up, but not while it's shut down. 
only the power adapter works then. And to power it on, you have to hold down the power button for like 5 seconds. Four of the six tiny Phillips screws on the bottom came from the factory stripped, so I couldn't even open up the bottom and show you the inside. I also couldn't install an NVMe SSD using the little access door, because one of the screw posts was just barely in the way. Also, one time, the keyboard and mouse buttons just didn't work, but a reboot fixed that. Like I said, devs and tinkers expect these kind of speed bumps, but if you buy one of these and it's annoying you, don't say I didn't warn you. All that out of the way, I ran some benchmarks. I'll link to my full test report, but there are a few things I want to highlight. The T-Head 1520 is a quad-core RISC-V system on a chip. It has four C910 cores, and to save on battery and help keep this thing cool, it's underclocked to 1.5 GHz. I've tested a ton of ARM SBCs and also high-performance ARM chips like the Snapdragon. How does this new RISC-V chip stack up? Not well. I mean, it's not as slow as the JH7110 in the Mars 5 and Vision 5 II I tested last year, but it's definitely not fast. It feels more like a Pi 3 than a Pi 4, and that plays out in these benchmarks. It's a big step up for Risk v but it's still a far cry from where SBCs were even five years ago. And here's the bottom line. A lot of people keep telling me ARM's days are numbered and Risk v is the next revolution. I mean, maybe. But when ARM started eating away at Intel's low-end, it was already winning on efficiency. With RISC-V, at the very tiny microcontroller level, it's doing pretty good. But there still aren't any high-performance cores that are even close to the efficiency of ARM yet. And this chart doesn't include even more efficient chips like the ones from Rockchip, Apple, or Ampere. Add on the fact that the RISC-V CPUs are a lot slower, and the only advantage right now is the open ISA. And that doesn't just magically save a company millions of dollars when they're building a new chip. So, am I still excited about RISC-V? Yeah. Do I see it eating ARM's lunch, or Intel for that matter, anytime soon? No, at least not for anything beyond really low-end devices. China especially would love to see that change, and more power to them, but it's going to take longer than most people think. That's the CPU cores, though. For graphics, this thing includes an Imagination PowerVR GPU. How does it hold up? Well, for raw performance, the GL Mark II score is 614. That's about on par with a Pi 4, but slower than the Pi 5. That's not bad at all, and I actually had some fun playing Super Tux Kart on it. With the defaults at 1024 by 768 I got 30 to 40 FPS. Everything worked fine, but if I tried changing the resolution, the game would crash. But what about Doom? I was worried I'd have to compile it from source, but luckily the DSDA Doom package was available out of the box and easy to get installed. It ran even more smoothly, and graphics-wise, this is a great little machine for it. That is, with an external mouse. The little red point was even more infuriating here. It was just insane trying to aim with it. Luckily, there's USB, so carry along a mouse if you want to get those frags. Moving on to general I.O., the SoC is on par with most current ARM chips. LPDDR4X RAM performance is pretty good, and the built-in EMMC is plenty fast. I got over 200 megabytes per second read speeds. But like I said earlier, I couldn't get an NVMe drive to fit in the expansion slot. But even if that worked, here's the bottom line. The RISC-V CPU cores are the weakest part of this whole system. With more speed or more power efficiency, this thing could compete better even with all its warts. But as it stands, unless you're doing RISC-V development and want to try out the C910 cores on this thing, there's not much here, at least not for 400 bucks. For the novelty, it's cool to have one of these things around. It reminds me a lot of the little EPC I used in college. That thing was underpowered too, but I still loved it, and I just can't explain why. And this thing isn't terrible, it's just not a good value for around 400 bucks unless you really want a Risk v Cyberdeck. If you don't care about Risk v and you want performance or efficiency, there are better values out there. And if you just want to try out Risk v Cypede even makes other options for a lot less money. But it is cool to see Risk v in this new form factor. And as a Republic senator once said, We will watch your career with great interest. But until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.